Yes, so as uh, we remarked, uh, we have three equations. Um, the equation for the conservation of mass, mass flux, the equation for the conservation of momentum flux, uh, this one, and the equation for the conservation of energy flux, which is this one. We have three equations and six unknowns, two densities, one upstream, one downstream, two pressures, one upstream, one downstream, and two velocities, one upstream and one downstream. And if you think that we are introducing a new quantity here, enthalpy, uh, it's not really new. It can be quickly related to the pressure and density like this, right? So, uh, and enthalpy relates to the internal energy per unit gram, of course, uh, the internal energy of the fluid, whereas this half u squared relates to the energy of the fluid due to the bulk motion. Okay, so and it's important to add them together and so this represents energy conservation. So we are now ready to uh, start talking about things like u1, u1 over u2 or rho 1 over rho 2 and these are the jumps or rho 2 over rho 1 as the case might be. But remember these refer to jumps in normal quantities, normal to the shock surface, not tangential. For instance, normal velocity, this, there's no, you know, sense in talking about normal, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, uh, density. So, uh, normal quantities, e.g., velocity, normal velocity, okay. So, let's uh, jump right ahead and let's define the Mach number of the shock as u1 over Cs1. Okay, so this is just by definition. We could even have defined another Mach number which would be u2 over C sub s2 with re respect to the downstream quantity. This is just convention. Okay, uh, it is easy. I mean, it's conventionally one speaks uh, of the, um, the upstream Mach number. You should more correctly, it should really be talking. should really be saying upstream. Okay, so this is the upstream Mach number of the shock and so that's the definition. And using this and using uh, those three equations that we showed in the slide, we can show that, and I strongly urge you to do the little bit of algebra that's needed to show this. And you can show that rho 1 over rho 2 is this quantity. Gamma is just the adiabatic index, right? And so it can be, you know, five thirds or one as the case might be. And so all, as far as the fluid is concerned, so, so gamma is a constant. That's what I want to emphasize. Gamma is simply a constant. So as far as the fluid is concerned, what is the quantity that characterizes the fluid flow? There's only one quantity and that is the Mach number. Okay, so this is the only thing that appears in the jump condition and it is inversely proportional to the Mach number. Uh, so the larger the Mach number, the smaller the density jump, right? The smaller the Mach number, the larger the density jump. That's what this equation is telling you. So this is the density jump condition. Equivalently, you can also, once you have the density jump condition, you can immediately find the pressure jump condition or the, the speed the jump in velocity, in normal velocity, uh, mind you. Okay, it's very easy to show this, right? And this is the plot. This is a general, so everything and all of these, all of these, functions of only the 
Mach number M. The Mach number M is the only thing that matters. Okay, the Mach number does not explicitly appear in these equations, but you can play a little bit and recast these equations in terms of the Mach number. Okay, and you'll find that this is how it appears. Okay, and this is the plot. So, since these ratios are functions only of the Mach number, and so the Mach number M. So, the Mach number is plotted on the x-axis and the ratios are plotted on the y-axis. The ratio, the pressure jump ratio, the temperature ratio or the jump in the sound speed or the jump in, in the density, all of these are plotted on the y-axis. Okay. Specifically, the log of the ratio is plotted. Okay. So, here it would be the ratio would be 1, here it would be 10, here it would be 100, here it would be 10 raised to minus 1 and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, what are the main things to be noted here? The first curve, to this is a rather busy graph and in this particular case we have taken, uh, you know, gamma to be equal to 5 thirds. Need not be the case. You can take gamma to be any other number, but this particular graph is, um, you know, uh, plotted with uh, gamma equals 5 thirds. So, let us first look at the density jump. This curve, which represents rho 2 over rho 1, this one. What does this show? This shows that the ratio of the downstream density to the upstream density increases with Mach number, it increases a little bit, right? So, and then it plateaus off. Beyond a Mach number of about, shall we say, this is something like 4 here, this one. Okay, this is a Mach number of about 4. So, beyond this, okay, the density jump pretty much plateaus off. Okay, maybe not four. Okay, so uh, this is about five. So yeah, something like the four. Okay. So what this is saying is that beyond a Mach number of about four, it does not matter how much stronger the Mach number is, the density jump remains the same. And the value for that is something like, well, it's hard to read off a log scale. Okay. So whatever this value is, and you'll find that. The velocity jump, this one, this looks like a flip of the density jump ratio. And indeed it is, because remember rho v or rho u, rho v is constant. So, in other words, rho 1 over rho 2 is equal to v 2 over v 1. So, if you are plotting v 2 over v 1, it is exact opposite of rho 2 over rho 1. Right, And not surprisingly, this also exhibits exact same behavior beyond a certain Mach number. Okay. The ratio plateaus off, except this ratio is smaller than 1. Remember, this is 1. So, this, is, this side is larger than 1 and this side is smaller than 1 because it is a log, log graph. Right. So, it plateaus off beyond about a Mach number of 4. What this is saying, I mean, it, it, the way people express this term, uh, this is, is to say that beyond Mach number of 4, you can effectively regard this as an infinitely strong shock. It is a bit misleading this terminology, an infinitely strong shock. It is not saying that the, the shock strength is actually infinite. In other words, the Mach number is actually infinite. No, it is not saying that. Anything larger than 4, anything that larger than a Mach number of 4 is effectively infinite. Okay. As far as the density jump and the velocity jump are concerned, it does not matter whether the Mach number is 5 or the Mach number is 100. It is the same result. So, that is why people normally say Mach number is an infinitely strong shock. 
Okay. So, um, I do not want to belabor this thing. So, this, this is how the you know uh, the ratios look like uh, for the density jump and the velocity jump. The downstream Mach number m2 also looks very much like the velocity curve. Okay, then this is the downstream Mach number. What what is plotted on the x axis is the upstream Mach number. Okay, so the everything is written in terms of the upstream Mach number. So, the downstream Mach number looks like this. You increase the upstream Mach number, the downstream Mach number reduces. Okay, so the flow is, is transitioning and they say all over here because you are lower than 0, you are basically saying that the, that the quantity is less than 1. Okay, so, this is the log of the downstream Mach number. Right? So, it is less than 1. No surprise, what the shock does is it takes a supersonic flow okay, and turns it into subsonic flow. That is why all over here, you know, the, the M2 is less than 1. Uh, the sound speed, the C S 2 over C S 1, this is the sound speed ratio keeps increasing, it keeps increasing. There is no plateauing of the sound speed ratio, but the increase is quite gentle with increasing Mach number. By Mach number, we mean upstream Mach number. Similarly, this is the ratio of the temperatures T2 over T1, this is the ratio of the pressures P2 over P1. All of these, once you know rho 2 over rho 1, which is what we have written down here, or rho 1 over rho 2 equivalently, it is the same thing. You can immediately write down P1 over P2, T1 over T2, V1 over V2 is just the flip. Okay. So, to uh, um, emphasize, Right, that's why, that's why this and and this this graph, they look like flip versions of each other. Um, the other thing to say is that often there's uh, there's another name. These uh, shock, we've simply said um, you know shock jump conditions. But if you look in books, these are called uh, Rankine Hugonio. jump conditions, same thing. Okay, this is the name, uh, named after the two scientists who pioneered uh, uh, this field. Okay, so, these are the Rankine-Hugonio conditions and this graph, uh, you know, gives you all the information there is to need. So, I urge you to stare at this in detail and think about it. Okay, and, and, and the other thing we said was essentially any Mach number above 4 uh, is a, essentially an infinitely strong shock. It is not like the sh uh, strength of the shock is infinite, it is just that anything above you know as far as the density jump and the velocity jump which are the two main jumps you know uh, that are um, you know often considered as far as the density and the velocity jumps are considered, anything above 4 does not matter. Okay? The Mach number can be 4 or 100 is the same jump in density and velocity. It is in that sense that for shocks with Mach numbers greater than 4 are called infinitely strong shocks. So, I just wanted to you know emphasize that a little bit. Yeah. So, this is what I was just saying clearly, well not just the ratios, the density and velocity ratios. It is not the reason I said this is because you can see that the pressure and temperature ratios and other things they do not plateau off. It is only the density and velocity ratios they plateau off at large Mach numbers. right? And you can see this just from the expression. For Mach numbers much much larger than 1, rho 2 over rho 1 is just a constant and this is exactly this plateau. It's just a constant. There's no Mach number appearing here. Why is that? You look at this. You look at the expression here. When the Mach number becomes much much larger than one, this term is negligible. 
So this goes away. All you've got is gamma minus 1 over gamma plus 1. That's it. So that's what this is saying. There we had rho 1 over rho 2, whereas here we are written, writing rho 2 over rho 1. That's why this is also flipped. There's no Mach number dependence anymore. And if this is rho 2 over rho 1, this will be equal to, this will naturally be equal to v1 over v2. Same thing, right? Yeah, it's just a flip. So, I beg your pardon, sometimes I write v, sometimes I write u, it's, it's the same thing. It refers to the fluid velocity. And the reason is simply, just to show you once again, it's simply because of the way this term appears. When, uh, uh, when Mach number is much, much larger than 1, this term is approximately equal to 0. Right. So, for the time being, I'll just erase this is not so important if I can find the eraser. Anyway, I mean, you know, so this is uh, for, I should say, uh, for very large Mach numbers, this is essentially equal to 0. Okay. So, that is what this is saying. Does it make sense? Of course, it makes sense, right? Because That is why this is the flip of that. The ratio of the pressures, okay, is, is essentially you can write P equals NKT, okay, or you can go back to the basic conservation equations and, and derive this again. The ratio of the pressures looks like this. It does have a Mach number dependence. That's why the pressure ratio, you remember this? The pressure ratio keeps increasing with Mach number. It does have a Mach number dependence and that is that is reflected here. Okay. And all these are, you know, all these hold only for Mach numbers much, much larger than 1. Okay. And generally, generally, just means As long as you're above four, you're essentially an infinitely strong shock. Generally, this that's what it means. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to emphasize this because generally you would say, well, Mach number, any quantity in physics, if you want it to be much larger than one, it has to be larger than at least ten. Okay, it should be something like one hundred or one thousand. Only then this kind of a thing. In this particular case, that's not so. That's why I'm saying it. If you're above four, above something like four or five or something, you're already in this much, much larger than one regime. Okay, I just wanted to emphasize that. And you can see that from the plateauing off of the density ratio and the velocity ratio. Okay. So now, having talked about shocks and these interesting things, um, we now start talking about what are called transonic flows. Transonic flows essentially means a transonic flow is one uh, that uh, transitions from mark number less than one to Mach number greater than 1. Okay. Of course, through Mach number equal to 1, naturally, you are uh, transitioning from a subsonic flow, which is Mach number, sorry, <laughs> very, very sorry, it is not this. Yeah, Mach number less than 1 to Mach number greater than 1. So, this would be a subsonic flow, right. So, a transonic flow is one which transitions from a subsonic flow, which is Mach number less than 1, to a supersonic flow, which is Mach number greater than 1, through Mach number equal to 1. Naturally, you will encounter Mach number equal to 1 while transitioning from a subsonic flow to a supersonic flow. Yeah? And these are called transonic flows. 
The reason we pay attention to this is because we, as we have seen the character of subsonic flows and the character of supersonic flows very, very different. Very subsonic flows are essentially quasi hydrostatic pressure gradients and pressure differences and boundary conditions play a very vital part. Supersonic flows on the other hand uh, are essentially ballistic. Boundary conditions really, they, they do not care about boundary conditions. And uh, so, the, the character is very different. So, while transitioning, one has to pay special attentions. I mean, it is one thing when we are dealing with entirely subsonic flows or entirely supersonic flows. Certain terms can be neglected and you can go on with the analysis. However, as with any um, you know, thing in physics, uh, when you are dealing with trans uh, sonic flows or, or flows that straddle these two asymptotic limits of subsonic and supersonic. When you are straddling these two limits, uh, you have to be a lot more careful. Okay, right. So, uh, so these are what are transonic and in particular, we will pay attention to transonic one dimensional flows. In other words, say just the x dimension, y and z are not important. Yeah, so why are we discussing this? Because why are we discussing this in an astrophysical fluid dynamics class? Because transonic one dimensional flows are of essentially of great importance in understanding things like astrophysical jets. But before talking about astrophysical jets, let us talk about an engineering application uh, because these things are much better established in the lab. And then we will go on and, and apply our understanding uh, to, uh, uh, to astrophysical jets. Okay, right. So, we already know something about. So, let us talk about flow through a pipe, a transonic flow through a pipe. Okay? We already know something about this, in fact. We use the same, same, uh, you know, the same kinds of equations. We write mass conservation in the following form rho A u equals constant, where A is the cross section, sorry, A. Is the area of the pipe which we allow to vary? A can vary with x. You can transition from a thin pipe to a thick pipe. This is the main thing, right? And and what does what exactly does this represent? You see again, dimension analysis rho is something like uh, grams per centimeter cube and A is something, is an area therefore, it is something like centimeter squared and U is centimeter per second. So, what this is essentially saying is that this is expressing not the conservation of mass flux, but the conservation of a quantity which is grams per second. We call both mass conservation. We call in earlier when we were talking about shocks, we, we call conservation of mass flux just mass conservation. In this case, we are still calling it mass conservation, but we are really conserving grams per second. That is what we are doing here. Okay, rho A u equals constant, where A is a cross sectional area of the pipe, which is allowed to vary with x. Okay. The other thing is the Bernoulli constant, which is essentially an energy conservation equation, and that can be written as this. This is slightly different from the way we were writing it earlier, but it is essentially the same thing. Where C s is of course, the sound speed which is allowed to vary, hmm? which can vary. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, now the question we ask just based on these two equations, how does the flow behave in a diverging or a converging channel? A diverging channel would be one that, that looks like this this would be a diverging channel. A converging channel would be one that looks like this, a nozzle. This would be a converging channel. And of course, you know, a clever people would put these two together. You would have a channel that converges, goes through a throat and then diverges. But before that, let us try to understand how a transonic flow would behave in a diverging channel, how it would behave in a converging channel, right? So, let us try to understand this. 
instead of writing instead of writing rho a u equals constant how about writing it down like this this i emphasize is the same as can you see how this is so what you do is you know you differentiate both sides with respect to x right and so this is just the chain rule and you divide everything by rho a u both sides when you differentiate a constant with respect to x you get zero so that's how you get this okay it's the same thing rho a u is equals constant to the integral form and this is the differential form the differential form is more useful to us okay right and the differential form of the inviscid momentum equation we don't bother about viscosity we are not concerned even with shock thicknesses or anything okay we are concerned about flows that transition from subsonic to supersonic not via a discontinuity not via a shock but smoothly okay and even when we were discussing shocks we neglected viscosity so we neglect viscosity here too but it's important to realize that we are considering shockless flows flows that transition from subsonic to supersonic without a shock this is also something that you should keep in mind not all transitions from subsonic to supersonic in other words from mach number less than 1 to mach number greater than 1 need to go through a discontinuity ie a shock they can be smooth and that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here so that's the differential form of the inviscid uh, momentum equation if we combine these two using the familiar sound speed we combine this again i strongly urge you to show show the following result this result okay and this is a very important result okay so this would be the way the velocity changes this would be the way the area changes the area of the of the um, tube so da dx you see for instance consider a converging channel like this so and if this is x in this case you see the cross sectional area of the tube is large here and small here isn't it it's it's large here and it's small here so in other words in this case uh, da dx is less than 0 and it's opposite da dx would be larger than 0 for a diverging channel in this case for a converging channel da dx is less than 0 that's what it would be right and uh, yeah so let's sort of look at this equation and try to see there's a lot hidden here okay and this is a very important equation and there's a lot hidden here so I repeated that equation here consider subsonic flows consider flows that have mach number less than 1 in other words right consider this so when da dx is less than 0 in other words a converging channel as we uh, you know sketched in the last uh, slide does is du dx larger than 0 or less than 0 let's just look at this equation right so mach number is less than 1 which means that this is negative m square minus 1 is yeah so and then the a itself is always a positive quantity the area itself is always a positive quantity isn't it so um and the da dx is less than 0 right so um say the mach number is 0.1 right 0.1 times 0.1 is 0.01 so 0.01 minus 1 is always negative and what we're saying is that da dx is also negative everything else is positive so the negatives cancel each other so is du dx going to be greater than 0 or less than 0 right obviously is going to be greater than 0 and this conforms to intuition you pinch you take a garden hose pipe right and you pinch it in other words you decrease the area and you find that the speed of water coming out from the nozzle okay is larger right you take a garden hose and you pinch it in other words you make it a converging channel like this 
and you find that pinching it makes the uh, water squirt out. Water squirts out fast. In other words, the flow accelerates. So this conforms to intuition when the water flow is subsonic and in everyday situations of course the water flow is subsonic it's very much the speed of the water flow is very much lower than the speed of sound okay so subsonic flows do conform to intuition and the, and the opposite can be said if dA dx was larger than one if, if you if you consider a diverging channel you have a fast flow and as soon as it encounters a diverging channel it slows down the du dx would be less than zero so this is what your intuition tells you but what about if Mach number is larger than 1. What about supersonic flows? In that case, what happens is th this quantity is larger than 1, right? And the entire thing gets reversed. If, if dA dx is less than 1, now you see, now we are considering, uh, you know, supersonic flows. Now we are talking about supersonic flows. So this quantity is always positive. Once this is positive, if dA dx is negative, then du dx is also negative. It's forced to be negative. If dA dx is negative, in other words, if it's a con converging flow, du dx is forced to be negative. So for supersonic flows, what we're saying is that if the flow here was supersonic, you pinch the nozzle and the flow actually slows down. Very strange. Does not conform to intuition. That's the reason we're talking about it here. Okay. And in a diverging nozzle, if you have a diverging nozzle and you have a supersonic flow, the flow actually accelerates du dx is actually greater than 0. So this is very strange. Yeah, so for Mach number greater than 1, the signs of dA dx and du dx are the same. So a supersonic flow decelerates in a converging channel and accelerates in diverging channel. This is really uh, something strange and, and this does not conform to intuition. And uh, so when you are transitioning from Mach number less than 1 to Mach number greater than 1 through you know, when you're going from the subsonic regime through equal to 1 to when you're going from a subsonic regime to a supersonic regime through, uh, you know, the sonic point, so to speak, that is that, that's when, you know, Mach number equal to 1, you have to be very, very careful. And, um, and this is an example of what's called De Laval nozzle. And so, uh, so, so you can marry these two kinds of converging and diverging channels together to get some very interesting behaviors. And uh, De Laval nozzle, um, the concept of uh, the which is just this. A converging channel, you know, welded to a diverging channel through a throat, okay? And so uh, it really matters whether this flow is subsonic on this side or supersonic on this side. The behaviors will be very, very different. And so this was used for engineering applications and specifically, for instance, for uh, rocket thrusters, okay, where uh, if you want the flow to accelerate, if, the, if you want a large momentum thrust on the rocket, and you already know that the exhaust is supersonic, then you want a diverging nozzle at the end of the rocket so that the flow accelerates, okay. And so, so this was uh, really the concept of the De Laval nozzle was really um, thought of and studied extensively in such engineering applications. Uh, but as we will find out when we uh, meet next, um, it has uh, important applications in astrophysics as well, in, our, in, in trying to understand astrophysical jets. So that's it for now. <laughs>